Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Holzerker. And as I said earlier, when uh, I was so gracious to give him the word, uh, I'm a survivor relator of a false claims act that was filed back in August of 1989, known as 89C611 was the case docket number. And that was a litigation against Northrop Grumman Corporation um, on the part of Rex Robinson, uh, the other relator in the case who passed away two years before the case finally settled. He was living in a trailer in the middle of the desert in New Mexico, destitute and never again being able to work in the field of which he spent many years as uh, uh, an engineer. He was also an individual who was remarkable in that he was involved in all of the Apollo moon launches with NASA. He was also involved with the MX missile as an engineer before he came to work for Northrop Grumman. It was Northrop at the time. They hadn't merged with Grumman yet. And it was at that time that he became aware of wrongdoing within the uh, program that later became known as the Stealth Bomber. Um, I was involved in another part of the company in product assurance having to do with auditing large transactions and became aware of that they were scrapping more parts for programs than they had ever bought, uh, let alone the ones they were accounting for in the delivered items. And this amounted to quite a substantial amount of money. Uh, the corporation was facing a $1.2 billion loss and so decided to settle the case after 17 years of litigating for an amount that was returned to the United States Treasury of $139 million. Through the course of this litigation, one of the things that happens to individuals and whistleblowers is, is that you become isolated. Who do you trust? You become aware of something that has gone wrong and the very people whom you were relying upon to build your sense of self and world you come to find out are corrupt. So who do you talk to? Who do you go to? Well, I went to the internal security of Northrop Corporation and brought all of these uh, things to their light, and they tried to involve me in the cover-up, and I just couldn't do that. And I was approached by a federal agent to help them, and I remember when they snuck me up in the freight elevator in the Dirksen Federal Building in downtown Chicago, um, so that the spotters that Northrop keeps within the lobby of the Dirksen Federal Building wouldn't see who the federal agents are talking to because they said, who is it easier to follow? 5,000 employees or a handful of federal agents to see who they're talking to? They follow the federal agents. Well, that also creates isolation. You now get legal representation. Your lawyer doesn't want you to talk to anyone. You're in the process of filing these suits. And the nature of a False Claims Act suit is they go under immediate seal. And that is so that the federal government has the opportunity to look into your, ch your charges and allegations to see if they can bring criminal indictments against the perpetrators of these frauds. And what happens is, is while they're under seal and the grand jury is conducting their investigation, you can't talk about it. You can't even t say that you have a lawsuit filed. So you're isolated. And then when it gets underway, of course your attorneys don't want you talking and spilling the beans because everything that you say to anybody is what becomes known as dispositive, or it can be become discoverable. They want to know who you talk to and what you said. And I remember one time speaking with my friend Rex. He said at his deposition, when they asked him that question, who did you talk to? And he said, anybody who would listen for longer than 20 seconds. <laughs> So, <laughs> that's another thing about whistleblowers, but when it's all over too, they generally settle these cases after many years of litigation, and they usually put what's known as confidentially, confidentiality issues upon the settlement agreement. In other words, they don't want you talking about it. You can talk about what happened to you in the sense of general generalities, but you can't say, well, they did this and they did that because really they settled and you didn't prove it. So you can find out for yourselves that you're going to wind up being sued if you then start talking about it. And guess what? It isolates you more. So whistleblowers are usually alone a lot. And so what, what happened is, is that after speaking with Janet Chandler, Dr. Janet Chandler, a clinical psychologist who, is, who lives in the Chicago area, and I happen to live in that area myself too, we decided to put our heads together and start what's known as the Mentoring Project. 
and to provide a service for those who are whistleblowers in the whistleblower community by whistleblowers to help them process and get through this long, arduous journey with a little sense of sanity and help them to realize that there's light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, whether or not you have to realize that you have to rebuild yourself. In other words, well, look, I went to school for 187 college credit hours, and I was sweeping parking lots and delivering newspapers for 12 years while this case went on. My wife and I and our children, we wound up in a homeless shelter, and I was unemployed and couldn't find a job. I got over 400 rejection letters from companies that wouldn't hire me anymore. I had to learn how to do something else. I had to take care of my family. And I did that with the help of my, my wife who stuck through all of this with me. And there's a lot of things that she said during that time. She said, Jim, you know, you need to build a bridge and get over it. And that's something that we did. Together we did that and it helped us put a lot of this behind us. So we talked about that. And we see that many whistleblowers, they face these situations. It's like they're looking over a cliff. They're isolated, they're confused, they don't know what to do with themselves. And so we started this mentoring project with TAF. And as you see, they've graciously agreed to be advisors for us. Their legal staff has looked at several issues about the legal ramifications of people talking to us. You know, uh, we don't want to get sued. You know, we've already spent a long time in litigation and we don't want to, we don't want to spend more time in it. And then we have this uh, distribution network that when people call in and they say, well, I'm a whistleblower in law enforcement. Well, we would put them in touch with someone who is from law enforcement, somebody who understands the unique issues that these individuals face. I myself was in accounting and engineering. I, I might not understand the unique problems that a firefighter or a law enforcement person would have. And it's the same with Dr. Janet Chandler. Now, when we first structured this, you can see some of the things that we have here. The way that it works here for TAF, for Taxpayers Against Fraud, is that the attorney would contact TAF, and then they put that individual in touch with either myself or, do or Dr. Chandler. And what this does is it prevents us from being overloaded with an immense amount of phone calls from just everybody. <coughs> well, hey, what do you do? Well, this helps also protect us, too, in a legal sense, because if your attorney tells you to call us, realizing that you're going to talk to someone and you'd rather have them talk to us rather than the bartender. Well, then it's, it, it falls under his umbrella uh, of the issues of that. Now, one thing that we notice here in the last section down here, it says mentors, well, we don't keep written records. That can become a danger. You write down information that people tell you. Because guess what? You'll be traveling around the country spending all your time giving deposition testimony of what somebody said to you and provide documentation to these corporations when they find out that you've talked to the people who are suing them. So we don't write it down. We, we try to keep the, the level of dispositive issues to a minimum. Another thing that we found is, is that we were, first when we were structuring this, we were thinking about having some type of form for this very purpose. Well, we've already seen that in reality is different than the planning phase. We found that in reality it's best not to have the forms. We don't have them. And so, only if someone who is a, is a mentee calls you and says they want to give you contact information to call them back, it's not necessary that they do so, that's entirely up to them. And some of the things that we're doing is, is that we're to assist one another. If somebody calls you and says that they need help and you can't help them, please, please let the person who's doing the distribution know that. And so what we've, we've, we've seen of doing with this mentor project is there's some issues that were coming up that were unique that came back through the TAFNET. Now TAFNET is a group of 400 key TAM attorneys who've come together and they speak with one another. And these are some real issues that the attorneys had, such as protecting the seal. Is it a violation of federal law for someone to call you and say they need help? And why do I say that? It's because remember when I said about what's unique about the False Claims Act? Is, is that you can't disclose you have a lawsuit? Well. And they went to their legal board and also spoke to a judge on this issue. And what they came to find out is as long as there isn't a full disclosure who the parties to the lawsuit are, you haven't violated that law. You haven't broken the seal. And if someone just calls you up and says, hey, my name is John or Susan or, or whatever, and not really identify fuller, fully, they haven't broken the seal. And so they haven't violated that federal law and got their case tossed out for technicality. 
Also, another thing that they talked about was the attorney-client privilege. That was something that was of, of real concern to them. And we, we spoke to them at the TAF conference last year and reminded them that the privilege belongs to the client. It's not the attorneys. It belongs to the client. We, we have to be, though, guarded when we speak to them to, to stop them when they start talking and maybe violate that because what they do tell you can you be discovered. So you don't want something that they're told only their attorney to be told you. And that, that's where it comes in. That you need to be careful of who your mentors are because you don't want to want to find it sitting on the internet somewhere, something somebody has told you. Another issue that came up was the question of client stealing. The nature of these types of cases, they last a long time. Generally, they're under seal from anywhere from three to five years while they're being investigated by an overburdened judicial system. Because take, you know, for reality, there's only so many U.S. attorneys and there's only so much they can do in a day. But they take a long time. And so what happens is the person becomes frustrated. He hasn't been hearing anything. It's under seal. And so now the next thing he does, he calls the mentor, and the mentor says, boy, have I got an attorney for you. Well, that was a real concern. If their attorneys were afraid, their clients would leave them and go somewhere else. Well, we don't advocate one law firm, one attorney over another. That's not our function. Our function is to listen to people who have a problem. What did you do to get through that? So that's one of the issues that we dealt with, too. So, remember that bridge I told you about? That's that bridge there that we're talking about. It's helping people to reconnect, to rebuild themselves and re-identify themselves. Yeah, maybe you have to learn a different vocation, or maybe you have to learn how to do something different, but that doesn't mean that you're still not a success. Remember, we're, we're people, we're individuals, we're, we're fathers, we're mothers, brothers and sisters, and like I said, whistleblowing is what we did. It's not who we are. And so it's, it's what we choose to identify ourselves with that make, can make a success. What's wonderful about this project that we've started, Dr. Janet Chandler and myself, is, is it is exportable. In other words, within your own groups and organizations, you can start this at a minimum cost. I think that the only thing that TAF has provided so far is the use of their phone switching service. So if you were to call TAF, Taxpayers Against Fraud, and put in that extension, you come right directly to me on the phone, no matter where I am in the country that phone is forwarded to me. So you talk to a real person rather than just getting up. And the sound of the tone, you know, push button three if you want to talk to, no, you, 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 get, you, you talk to me. And then from there we go. And I'll tell you, I've had a bit of a success. And now Jim Murtaugh had mentioned earlier, who was the first person that I mentored? It was Dr. Janet Chandler, who was the first person to call me that I spoke to. And that's how we got working together afterwards and starting this project. And, and helping others to make that connection back into redefining themselves as a, as a successful individual. So I really appreciate all the time that you've spent uh, here to, to listen to what I had to say about the mentoring initiative and, and hope that you, you can benefit yourself by thinking. Yes, the question. Have you gotten to the point where you've been, um, where people have been deposed, the other side has tried to depose the mentors? Is what the mentees told them for purposes? No, we have never had that happen. And how long is the project? A year and a half. Okay. So, and I will tell you, yet. I have mentored now about 12 people. And have their cases gone to uh, been litigation? Yes. Yes, they've come out from under seal, several of them. Um, and no, I have not been. And the process hasn't been discovered? In Whether it's been discovered. If you don't speak of anything dispositive, and they call you up and say, well, what did they tell you? Well, they told me that their granddaughter had to go to the play and they didn't have the money to go, you know, or, or something like that. You know, it's, it has nothing to do with the case. It, it's useless. You, you have nothing that can hurt them and, and nothing they can hurt you with. So you're not discussing that. You're, you're helping people process, you know, and how to get through this is what you're doing. You're not talking about technicalities or legal issues or what they need to examine their case about. You're talking about personal things. Yeah, I was just thinking more in terms of damages. Right, right. right. I see what you're, where you're, you're going. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right, right. You know, um, that, has, that issue hasn't come up. Yeah. That's my statute, though, right? You get a share, you get a, a group, group, a related share. What's that? You get the, in terms of damages, you get the related share. Your relief is determined by the statute. 
run the false claims. So you're yeah. saying it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an issue because right. it doesn't have to be a separate determination of damages, which might not be true in other kinds of right. in other right. kinds of cases right. where there's compensatory damages that had to be determined. Right. Okay. Actually, there's a, a section H of the False Claims Act that is an anti-retaliation provision that would also take into account the original <coughs> person. Okay. And generally, these cases settle. They don't usually go to court. And that's the way it, reality is. If, if I would say less than probably 1% or 2% actually wind up in trial. The rest usually settle or are dismissed on technicality. And one of the biggest technicalities they have to breach is the public disclosure. That's, that's a big one. That, that's a big bar for False Claims Act if, is if there has been public disclosure. And first to file. Yes. Question for you. In your opinion, do you think that the majority of cases with settling being put under seal, the results of those actions are in the public good? In my opinion, do I think that? No. No, I think it should be, that's the whole purpose, is to make it public. Right. Um, generally, it's, it's a technicality. I know that in my case, there were issues that were, were, you say it's under seal, but it's not. It's under a confidential agreement. There's a difference between a seal and a confidential agreement. Parts of my case were sealed because there were, of course, proprietary documents. There were also documents of national defense that were at issue. So those are sealed in the docket. But, uh, the rest of the cases out there, everything that was argued before the public is out there. I mean, someone were to put in 89C6111, they'll see 17 years of litigation and, and the documents that were all there. What you won't see is, is you won't see uh, the confidential settlement agreement, but you will see the settlement agreement that was released from the Department of Justice as far as the press release for the amount that Northrop you know, agreed to send back. Yes, I, I, you finished, I won't ask one question, but yeah, the confidentiality ahead. agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, there was a particular point where it, it wasn't under seal, but there was a confidentiality agreement, sort of, to where we we wouldn't mention these names. They gave us names of these individuals that showed up at the, uh, y'all remember this uh, this event where they were calling it the, um, in Tennessee, good old boy, mm -hmm. good old boy roundup, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, they, all this racist stuff was being taken place. And we had marshals that attended that. And so they said, we'll, we'll give you the names. Here are the names, but you under confidentiality not to disclose these folks. Now, so there's a difference in the confidentiality, but what I'm wondering right. is now this case is over. That would kind of look at me. It depends upon the terms of the provision. I have to go look at the terms we, of the We're coming up with another great, another great topic for next year, how confidentiality agreements are absolutely against the public interest. And I would right. never sign another one again. But it doesn't prevent reporters from looking into the documents which right. are public. The problem is they're too lazy to go down and, and look at them. There's also a distinction, I think, yes. that you've got to make between confidentiality agreements in which the terms of the settlement are known as opposed to your ability right. to talk about the case. Sometimes there may be an interest in making the settlement agreement um, from the plaintiff side even confidential because everybody just think, would think oh it's you know then you can just walk around and saying I really right. I, you know I, I got it you know I got it so right. that's different though than the ability yes. to be able to Absolutely. talk about the merits um, of the case yeah. where I can see from Zena standing up that she, she would like me to sit down <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much and 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 I appreciate it topics in mind for next year. We're hitting the, the, the questions are hitting on exactly what we got to be talking about. I really wasn't so much interested in Jim sitting down, but I just want everyone to understand that we're going to have to work together in order to map out this afternoon's program because, you know, you heard uh, time waits for no man, and, and that's just the truth. So when we, we get a late start, we got a substantially late start this morning, um, trying to make sure that everyone is here and can be a part, but when you, you, you gain there, but then you lose time for some very important things to get covered under the program. So uh, let's just sort of do a point of order. I know we've got some uh, a presiding panel. Well, before I do that,
given the time constraints, and also given that some very important people who, who are going to know about what happened here today and what was said today, they're not here. So I, I just can't emphasize enough that for uh, the people who need to hear about what happened today that who are not here, the only way they're going to really to know your views is, is if you get them to us and hopefully you can uh, take the time now and, and get it written on your forms so we can have them and we'll make sure that you know, the, the, the bell is wrong and, and that, that what happens here today has an impact. Okay, so I know people are anxious to speak but I can't overemphasize how important it is to get your comments in writing if you really want um, members of Congress and the general public to, to, to hear your views, because they're not all here. Some very important people are here, but um, there's also people we need to hear uh, who are not here today. Now, we also have some presiding panelists who may not be able to stay the whole afternoon. Um, and all of the witnesses, their written statements are going to be submitted to the presiding panelists. Um, all the debate arguments, we'll have that available in writing. So everyone will be heard, even if they're not heard today.